I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today. We are fortunate to be joined by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the Distinguished Scientific Advisor at Universa Investments. Dr. Taleb spent 21 years as a risk taker, also known as a quantitative trader, before becoming a researcher in philosophical, mathematical, and mostly practical problems with probab probability. Dr. Taleb is the author of a multi-volume essay, the, In the Incerto, you might be familiar with these books, The Black Swan, Fooled by Randomness, Anti-Fragile, and Skin in the Game, covering a broad facet of uncertainty. It has also been translated into 39 different languages. In addition to his trader life, Nassim has also written as a backup to Incerto more than 70 scholarly papers in statistical physics, statistics, philosophy, ethics, economics, international affairs, and quantitative finance, and all around the notion of risk and probability. He is currently the Distinguished Professor of Risk Engineering at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering, only a quarter of, quarter of his time uh, dedicated to that position, and he's a scientific advisor for Universa Investments. His current focus is on the properties of systems that can handle disorder, which is anti-fragile. Nassim refuses all honors in anything that turns knowledge into a spectator sport. Nassim, I know this is gonna be an interesting conversation. You will be interviewed by none other than Jillian Tett, editor at large at the Financial Times. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. And I've been hugely looking forward to this conversation for three reasons. Firstly, because Nassim is one of the most brilliant minds that I know. I think we first met seven, eight years ago. I had the honor of trying to interview him and Danny Kahneman on a stage at the same time. And it was a challenge. Was that, was that a mess? It was, it was a challenge. <laughs> um, but secondly, you in the room may not know, but we really are very lucky to have him on stage today because you don't get out very much on platforms like this, do you? Uh, it depends. Well, every few, you know, uh, every two years and four months, you come out. And every few years and few months. Well, he very rarely agrees to do interviews right. like this. Um, but thirdly, as we heard from Mohammed Alarian earlier, we live at a moment in history when our cozy late 20th century ideas of stability and how to predict the future and how to assess risks are frankly being blown apart in a way that's left many investors, many politicians, many journalists feeling very deeply disorientated. Um, Mohammed al talked about moving from a world of a bell-shaped curve of probabilities to a bimodal world to a world where there's potentially fat tails, great extremes of risk, potential great, potential great uncertainty. And Nassim, you've spent your, almost your entire life looking at risk and essentially telling people in the Western world that they get it mostly wrong. Yeah, I mean, I was an option trader all my life. I'm still an option trader. Uh, Universa is, uh, you know, the, the project started 20 years ago. Uh, as option trading, betting on tail events. Uh, so I'm an option trader, and option traders have a different view of the world, uh, you know, because you're exposed to the, it's like seeing, seeing uh, uh, the car, putting the car, uh, uh, you know, on a, on a, in, a, in a circuit and driving it uh, uh, 300 miles per hour. It's a different, you know, environment. So when you trade options. So it's a different world, and, and we're more cynical. But let me make one comment. If I had a Mexican peso, every time, every time someone told me that we live in a different environment, okay, the world has more uncertainty in the past. If I had that Mexican peso, you know, every time someone told me that over the past, say, 30 years, I'd now own a, a big chunk of Mexico. <laughs> because, because it is normal to feel that the future is uh, going to be different from the past, and it's normal to have an anxiety and to feel something. But the, so let me uh, tell you, distributions, the world has always been non-Gaussian, always been fat tail. You've always had a lot of hidden risks. And, but once in a while, 
people who have uh, you know common sense detect these risks and and uh, and act on them. And, and it's typically when 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 you feel there's a largest amount of risk that in fact the system is the most stable. Well, one of the messages from your book, Anti-Fragile, yes. was that chasing after a super safe world and trying to remove risk actually creates more risks a huge in the long risk. term. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so let me give the me metaphor uh, uh, at two levels, uh, you know, systemic and an individual. If you want to remove the risk from your life, okay, uh, what would you do? Is it, is it an option? You stay in bed. Of course, you can uh, you know, order a copy of the Inserto, five volumes. Okay? And then, of course, you can other other books. You stay in bed. You don't leave your bed. You make sure it's a sterilized environment, no germs. Okay? You'll have no risk. And then, right after that, take a ride in the uh, uh, Tokyo subway at you know, peak hour. How many seconds did you survive? Three, four, five before. The, okay, so, so the 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 route to uh, safety is not necessarily the route that has a small, the least amount of volatility. In fact, in fact, and 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 there's something that shocks risk analysts. Typically, the metric for a healthy company is a company that has a lot of volatility, condition on surviving volatility. It's the opposite of sta stable companies. You know, in 2009. Uh, you know, there's something called sharp ratio that, 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 that usually doesn't measure anything, actually, but it measures something. Is a high sharp ratio gives you a high probability of blowing up, okay? And, and this is the thing it measures the most, okay? If you have high sharp ratio, stable income, 2008, 2009, the firms that blew up were the ones with the high sharp ratio. So, so just to tell you that trying to avoid risk doesn't come via avoidance of volatility. It's exactly the opposite. You know, I compare the regimes of Saudi Arabia. No political volatility in the past, uh, almost for the past 200 and some years, versus Italy. Italy is very volatile politically. Which one is safest? Okay, last time I checked, Italy was standing. Right, you know, Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry, I, I lose concentration. Is that enough? So some, so some risk taking. So, sorry, some volatility, and regular small failures, in a yes. way, is a better way to guard against it, 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 big it, cataclysmic problems. Exactly. So <laughs> another comment, systemically, the, the industry in America that has a high, the, the second industry, you know, the industry that has the second highest failure rate, the restaurant business. And I haven't seen any bailout, uh, generalized bailout of restaurants as far as the government. And the first one, of course, is Silicon Valley. Right. And America has the highest rate of bankruptcy in the world. Right. So you'd like to have <laughs> increase that rate creation. if you want to make it healthier. So your book, Black Swan, essentially said that people need to recognize that unexpected, dramatic risks can happen that we don't have yes. the imagine to see, imagination to see. Andy Fragile argued that we should embrace that, that actually regular small failures are a better way to create a robust system than chasing after endless stability. And now you have a new book out, which is called Skin in the Game, Hidden Asymmetries in Daily Life. What are you trying to say in this? OK, so uh, uh, you, the way I write books, you, you write a book, and then, uh, then you realize you, you're not done. OK, so, so Or else so you your publisher footnotes. says, what about a sequel? So, so you continue, all right? And at the end of Antifragile, Antifragile is mostly about convexity. It, it, a lot to do with hormesis, how systems respond, but also about being long volatility. When you're long volatility, you have more upside than downside. Okay? I own an option. If you sell me an option, I'd be long volatility, but you'd be short volatility. So there are a lot of transfers of that option between individuals. And typically, you have someone ripping off uh, the system. Like, for example, bankers have the upside, and you know they transfer the down downside to others. Okay? So in Antifragile, of course, the last chapter was skin in the game. About that idea that you should, you should have a symmetry between risk takers and risk uh, receivers, okay? That usually people, some people own their own risk, some people transfer risk to others, and some people, the saints, take risks away from others. So that was the idea of anti-fragile. And, but I noticed that some people couldn't, couldn't go through anti-fragile, it's too complicated for them, hit on that point and loved it. And they thought anti-fragile was about <laughs> that last chapter about risk transfer. 
So I started writing, and you know, if you have no schedule, you don't have a publisher, uh, you, you don't take advances from publisher, you don't do anything, just write a book, and when you're done, you're done. So this one came naturally as a footnote, as from the ribs of anti-fragile, okay, and about symmetry. And then, but, but in the process of writing it, I started, I discovered a few things. For example, why was Donald Trump elected? Why, why was people, Donald Trump elected? No, no, but the first, the thing that actually I, I, I wrote down is why was he, why did he, uh, why did he get the nomination? So I was, you know, I watched CNBC with the sound off, okay? So typically, and, and I was watching. And then I saw the scene um, with Donald Trump debating uh, 12 people or whatever. It was a sound, it was off. Not that it makes any difference, but still, it's, it's very important symbolically. I looked at it. I said, this guy's gonna make it. I didn't when know When was why. that? Was that early in the campaign? It was during the nomination thing. Right. And, and then I was wondering, so I started, I don't know why it hit me that this guy's gonna make it. And I started telling everyone, the doorman, everyone, you know, the Uber driver, so, so kind of thing, that, you know, so excited. It's like a piece of information, why? Bec then I realized because he was alive and the others were sort of like dead. And I'm wondering why. It turned out that there was a smear campaign against him in the New York Times, that he lost a billion dollars. Well, losing a billion dollars makes you real. <laughs> you see, you have skin in the game. You, you're not, you know, playing with numbers. You're not some bureaucrat. So losing a billion dollars, particularly if it's your own money, makes you, you know, sort of, a, you know, a real person. So I went into history and looked at a lot of things that would, you know, how people uh, trumpeted the risk taking in society. How Roman emperors, for example. Mm -hmm two-thirds of Roman emperors died, and how people did not give any respect to non-risk takers, whether economic risk takers or uh, physical risk takers. Two-thirds of Roman emperors, as I said, died in battle, but largely, I mean, not died in battle, died of violent deaths. <laughs> the rest may be poison, but largely, uh, that, that violent thing was, was a badge of honor, like people, uh, you know, showing their scar, and it was, <laughs> You know, so you need to have leaders who look as if they've actually taken risks in order to earn to the earn respect. the status. The, so status came with risk taking to earn the respect of the exactly. people they lead. Exactly. Right? So I, I have the feeling that maybe he's not. He's a fake risk taker, but he fakes it very well right. <laughs> because and and all these attacks by the New York Times built him. And sure enough, I mean, that's you know we we know the rest of the story. So so that's and, and that was I didn't put it uh, if, you know. Uh, I didn't add it as footnote, you know, belated footnote to anti-fragile, but I have a feeling that that's, that, that's what, what people want. So do you think we need today to be thinking much more clearly about where people actually have skin in the game and where they don't we, we in can, terms of evaluating whether we're going to invest in an institution or what kind of policy framework we want to design? I mean, should we be talking much more about that? Yeah, you are an anthropologist. Yeah. So I left. Part of the reason we're friends, okay. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 I give the compliment the best, uh, uh, at least at the Financial Times, the best, the, the, the best person at Financial Times, but the most qualified or the deepest, uh, and of course, probably among all the London journals. But the, uh, the and of course, uh, New York one. But the, uh, so the reason, if you're not, so you have to answer, so you have to answer my question. You can answer the question, okay. People detect it. The Lord, can only be a lord if he takes risks on behalf of others. Because you are uh, trading status for risk taking, which is why during the Falkland War, they forced one of those princes to take more risk. They say, hey, what's the point of being a lord? Okay. And I suspect the French Revolution happened because you had a, um, a uh, caste of people who were lords, a noble. Uh, no uh, men without risk taking, and doesn't work. Plus, uh, Louis XIV created a new class of people, noblesse uh, de robe, people who were, uh, you know, uh, magistrates who became uh, no, no, uh, something didn't work. I mean, mm. you know, you, you don't mind if someone who takes more risk has a high rank in society, but you mind if someone who, you know, doesn't take risk. And, and it's the same thing in economic life. Uh, you, people don't mind it if. A uh, trader makes a lot of money, or someone makes a lot of money. Entrepreneur makes a lot of money. Steve Jobs gets billionaire. No, no, nobody's bothered that this, uh, uh, a chairperson of a company who basically doesn't have any downside risk 
that has a free option makes more than X number mm -hmm. what the truck driver of the company makes, that upsets people. Right. So people detect it. So, the, uh, so uh, and in society, those, uh, the, the, practically one society I found where the highest rank was not the risk taker, the physical risk taker, of all the societies I looked at. Right. So when you look at the current environment today in America, you know, we had a remarkable statement by Ray Dalio yesterday who said that rising income inequality is going to leave people fighting each other and creating global instability. We have a lot of concern about whether the financial system as it's currently constituted is stable or not. Are you concerned or do you, not concerned, but do you the expect first thing to see is, America uh, see a sort of big upsurge in political upheaval, political I, I think it's the other way. There is a reaction against people without skin in the game. Without skin in the without game. Without skin in the game. Uh, running so your, by the like bureaucrats people. or? Bureaucrats have, this is the reaction. Brexit is a reaction against bureaucrats. The most important chapter here, I mean, the least interesting chapter for me was sort of like a, a parody I put on a web that had, that was immediately pirated in Russia, right, after I posted it on, on a web called uh, IYI, Intellectual Yet Idiot. So people who are very good at school, who are good at taking exams, hired by people who are good at taking exams, and populating administration, and administration are becoming very opaque. And uh, to give you an idea, the ministers come and go in the UK. A certain minister, after reading Skin in the Game, called me up and said, listen, you're unfair to me. Why? I have no control of my ministry, he said. <laughs> he said, it's opaque. You know, you don't even know who owns which decision. And I'm here, you know, for maybe a year, maximum three years. Okay, these people have been here for 30 years. <laughs> And it's like Kafka's castle. Nobody knows. So this is what's happening in Europe. And all these opaque, large administrations. Uh, Washington. Okay, the, the deep state. It's not like the deep state. It's a deep administration. So this is what people are detecting. And they, 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 they get it. People get it. They're, you're an anthropologist. You know, people get it. People detect. Uh, they know when they're sort of like taken for a ride. I mean, maybe not immediately, but it doesn't take long. Maybe a century is long enough for people to figure it out. So that IYI, intellectually an idiot, was um, was published before before the election, before Trump's election. And which I say, people are rioting in India everywhere. They they sort of don't like bureaucrats. I mean, I can understand. I mean, they, you know, bureaucrats are not the most entertaining people, but but there is a reason. It's there's a, a the the government controls today. 10 times more as a proportion of GDP what it controlled in 1900. Like I'm saying, France, between 50 and 75 percent, it was below 7 percent. Okay. Uh, Sweden, uh, you take any country, the United States, less, but still much more than we did 100 years ago. So when you see that the governments are controlling more and more GDP and the agents are the bureaucrats, then you, you know, it doesn't take people uh, too long to figure out, okay? And then also they, 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 they see that it's the same bureaucrat also running large corporations. S&P 500 uh, corporations, they're like, what they call the empty suit. So that piece, a page and a half or maybe two pages, IYI. The IYI. The intellectual yet idiot, idiot chapter. Yes, chapter. That's what it's called, yeah. yes. That went, uh, that, that you spread a lot. The book is page 123. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that spread a lot. You can find it, if you Google it on the web, you can even find it in And the you said Croatia. earlier that that chapter, when you posted it online, yeah, yeah. had, was it, how many downloads in Russian? It has in total, so that one I don't immediately know. Translated it into Russian. It translated now into so many Pelagia's languages. At, uh, at some point, the Huffington Post posted it in Greek and uh, Greece. So I wrote, the, I wrote at the bottom, anybody can copy it and publish it except the Huffington Post. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the most. <laughs> so at the bottom, you can see it on this. Anybody can publish it in any journal. The New York uh, <laughs> Observer, when it still existed, uh, wrote to me, said, you know, they wanted to, to publish a copy of it. And of course, it translated three times in French. I think it had by now 8 million downloads. Uh, so 8 million downloads of just that, that chapter. For that IYI, intellectually at idiot. If you Google IYI, you'd, you see now it's a term, a, a standard term on, uh, on the web to describe I mean, it's basically, people. it's a shriek of outrage against the bureaucracy and the bureaucratic elite. 
Exactly. And if you like the elite that runs most of our lives. And the fact you without had, skin of the game. Without skin of the game. Without skin of the, the game. The fact you they, had eight million downloads. Yes. And people translated it voluntarily into yes. all these languages yes. so fast is really quite striking. I mean, one of the things I find fascinating about your ideas is that yes. you come from a really quite technically complex background of options pricing and derivatives trading, which isn't the sexiest thing in the world to turn into a popular bestseller. You've produced <laughs> this five-part series on how yeah. to deal with uncertainty and risk. And you've now had, what, 8 million sales in English? And it's been translated. No, not in English. Uh, uh, less than four in English. OK, only 4 million. Sorry, only yeah, 4 million. A few million is counting. But 4 million sales in English. It's not quite Harry Potter, but it's still astonishing. Yeah. Um, and you've been translated into 41 languages. Yeah, yeah. she said 39, but it was wrong. Since then, I, I well, was. Well, OK, uh, one or two <laughs> languages <laughs> we can so 40, Yeah, no, no, okay. 41, 41. Okay, 41. Yeah. So the point, the point I'm trying to make about bringing this out is that you know your ideas about risk Yes. have really seeped into popular consciousness in quite a profound way. Anyone who's interested in sort of tracking the way that zeitgeists change should but, look at this because it's fascinating. But let me tell you the mechanism. It was delayed because my first book was Fooled by Randomness, uh, published uh, you know, 20 years ago. Almost, no, actually, it was on a web uh, 23 years ago. And nobody wanted to publish it. It was too whimsical. And then, of course, uh, when it was published, it did very well. So it's like, uh, say, 19 years old, okay, Fooled by mm -hmm. Randomness. Uh, now, it, Fooled by Randomness, uh, th those who read Fooled by Randomness when they're 25, okay, I understand that idea, but for existing uh, Who read people, Fooled, Fooled by Randomness when they were 25 oh, okay. or All younger? Right. So, <laughs> so what happened is that you have to wait for the old generation to either die or go to Florida, which is the same thing, you know, <laughs> to retire. So, so what happened is that you can, I, I discovered you cannot to have an impact, if you want to have an impact with your ideas, don't work on... Uh, uh, people who already have, have who, who are done, okay, work on kids, because these kids will, <laughs> will, I, will, you know, it's much easier to convince someone who doesn't have any idea than someone who has already been established in something, particularly if the idea is against their income, goes against yeah. their income, which is, uh, you know, so so the the main idea, so this idea, so full by random is start to have an impact now, okay. And those who read Pool by Randomness, who are now in government and stuff like that, uh, you know, they, they send very long emails, unfortunately. But they, they still, I mean, you know, there's, there's some impact on perception right. of risk and, 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 and some of the mistakes people make. But sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, because I think your, the way you've shaped the, the zeitgeist is fascinating. The question I have is that when you wrote, Black, when you wrote Fool by Randomness, yes. people didn't want to listen originally because the CFA and every MBA course in the world has taught for years that there isn't such thing as a randomness and you can actually you know, plot it all and analyze it all. When you wrote Black Swan, again, you were writing against the tide because that was pre-financial crisis. And when Black Swan came out, no one could imagine the entire world blowing up. And yet now- And, and particu particularly that I mentioned Fannie Mae was, yeah. I was targeting Fannie Mae. I was, had an obsessive disorder with Fannie Mae that lasted <laughs> from 2003 until when well, it blew up in 2008. But it, so in the Black Swan, I make sure to tell, I had told, of course, the doorman, the, the taxi driver, there was no Uber. Everybody I met, Fannie Mae, was going to go bust. Just like Cato was saying, you must destroy Carthage, you know, Delenda Cartago. So my way was Delenda to Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae, and of course, went bust. So that was the, 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 the you know, the message in, in the Black Swan is that there, there are a lot of structures sitting on dynamite, yeah. that, and, and you can identify them. So my question really now, yeah. and I'm going to turn to the audience for questions in a moment, but my key question is this. Now, Black Swan has been a bestseller. Fannie Mae has gone bust. Yeah. Everyone in the room ha has learned in a very immediate way that systems can go bust. Does that mean that we are now today a lot safer there won't be another financial crisis in our lifetimes no. because we're all wiser. Or do you think the financial system could go bust again or okay. could produce the another e shock? The easiest way to answer you is I I'm certain Fannie Mae is going to go bust again the second time in an <laughs> identical way that it went bust the first time. Okay. This is, and, and the cure to that anyway is in um, Principia Politica, which is like a pamphlet on localism and on um, anti-verbalist, what I call it, uh, thing. <laughs> that really said that uh, uh, 
institution should have a, an expiration date. Public, public funded uh, institutions should have an expiration date because you don't have the laws of the market. But let me, let me give you a, a, an idea of what's skin in the game, you know, what inspires skin in the game. Uh, really the, the true inspiration, aside from the, 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 you know, the continuation of anti-fragile. Uh, you know, I retired from trading, you know, sort of like I'm passive, but you know, with Universal. So I retired from trading uh, into, into doing ma mass at NYU because I, I don't know, I, I have uh, no abilities in tennis and skiing and stuff like that. I, I mean, it's a little skiing, but I don't have abilities. So if you can't ski, you do advanced math instead. Yeah, whatever. So a friend of mine retired, okay, uh, same thing from Goldman, he was a partner on Goldman, retired, and, um, and he had the, the idea to lose his money slowly to, in, in the restaurant business. So, so, one, so, what, so he, 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 one day he called me up, he said, look, it's so funny, what, there's a gala dinner, okay, where they have they had awarded prizes throughout the year to restaurants, and there was that gala dinner, and he said, all these restaurants got prices, prizes were not there because they were out of business. <laughs> so, 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 so now we have two categories of people, you know, because a restaurant does, uh, you know, uh, uh, doesn't get the payment. You plastic, not you know the award, you know, and the award is given by whom? By peers, by either peers or journalists or people who are not the customer. So, when you so I, I figured out one thing is that any business that depends on judgment of peers is going to rot. Academia, so they go in the blind alleys where they become, you know, like some kind of closed circle or something. Whereas your plumber, how do you compensate your plumber? <laughs> you, you have a meeting of plumbers and then they give them a bonus <laughs> at your end? Or you say this is your peers, you know, we're going to give you a prize and then a bonus? No. It's your credit card or whatever, cash under the table, whatever it is. So there are two kinds of businesses. A business that has survival from PL. Okay, that, that's the skin of the game. So in other words, you, 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 you blow up, you disappear. And businesses where you're immune to uh, uh, that kind of stuff, where you get awards from other people. If you have people with a resume in Washington with four or five pages resume, they're not, with nothing but awards, okay? And, and of course, it's meaningless. I mean, the last, last week, that I'm, I'm Lebanese, the, the, the head of the central bank, who really was, everybody knows, was organizing the Ponzi scheme. Last week, got an award, a global finance award for the top uh, central bankers and governors. The guy was, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's no connection between reality. So, so you have to be connected exactly. to your customers and. You have to have a PL or some way an exit. So Darwinian evolution can only work if you die or if you're somehow, uh, you know, like a restaurant go bankrupt, you don't have to physically die, or if you're out of, out of the, the system. Right. So, that, that's, uh, so if you don't have that, Okay, the system doesn't work. The FT has a PNL. Okay, so the FT, but but the universities they don't have PNL, so they can they can sit down and they're not accountable to anybody except their peers. So you can have like the two parallel system. So based on that, the two kind of businesses we we'll say the plumber we know is an expert on plumbing. Okay, but some people macroeconomics I don't know if they're expert at macroeconomics. Okay, you you don't know they may be maybe not. Okay. People detect that. The person in the street detect that. They know who is potentially a fraud and who's not. Right. Well, it seems like a good moment to turn to the audience and see if anyone has any questions um, for Nassim about any of these ideas or anything else, or um, Black Swan or Riff. And as ever, it would be courteous but not compulsory just to identify yourself briefly. We have, we have a microphone, yes. Companies or structures uh, on top of dynamite. I thought that was quite an image. Can you, can you give us a couple of ideas that you have on some of those sorts now? I, I, okay, the, 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 the problem, I mean, I, I'm not going to identify, Fannie Mae, definitely, they still use the same risk management system and it's still the same uh, uh, scam that we had last time. So it's going to blow up, and again, because they don't have a PNL, they can lose 650 billion and then be rescued. So uh, therefore, they're fragile. There are a lot of situations in the same uh, you know, uh, condition. And, but I think states are the ones also we have to worry about, okay? Because states have this, uh, they're run by bureaucrats who don't pay for what happens when you raise debt. They don't scan in the game. 
and, and sure enough, uh, the populations have to pay the price, and uh, it's getting it's getting bad out there. Okay, so with some states, without mentioning which states in particular. You mean states, as in U.S. states? U.S. states. U.S. states. Okay. US states. US states are well. The one we're sitting in right now has got. Yeah, exactly. Quite I mean, this is yeah, this is a classical situation, situation of someone uh, with gold, you know, ending up having having junk, right? So. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so you have a, 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 a so without number, but the situation we have now. Do you own, a, do you own any muni bonds? No, I don't own any muni bonds. Skin in the game also forces me to only talk about uh, things I have an investment in. Okay, so which is contrary <laughs> to say, oh, uh, you know, to normal practice, you only talk about things you don't own. Uh, in fact, if if uh, don't tell me what you think, tell me what you have in your portfolio, because that way, if you're harmed. Um, if you're harmed, you know, it's ethical. You cannot harm others without being harmed yourself. So if you recommend the stock, tell me what you have. I don't, don't recommend. Tell me what you have, all right? Tell me what you own, what you don't own. For example, this is, this is a, the, and it's one of the rules of ethics I have in here. But I noticed one thing that's positive, and particularly for people, in, I, I'm not known for someone who gives compliments. I gave one uh, to, 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 I'm going to give one to the hedge fund industry. <coughs> Inadvertently, the Obama administration created skin in the game in finance by, by over-regulating banks, okay? A lot of the risk-taking moved to hedge funds. And it's much better risk-taking. Why? Because hedge funds fold without making, we had a lot of them folding without making the front page of New York Times, <coughs> just like California uh, technology companies. And then the other one is that when you invest with a hedge fund manager, we were arguing about the level of uh, investment, I guess between 25 and 70% of their assets are in their fund. And given that the largest client would have no more than 1% of her or his assets in the fund, it's 25 to 70 times more skin in the game than any other client, okay? Now that is something that is making, okay, this industry healthy. You see, the fact that people have, so this is why not, they don't blow up, they don't use, you know, fancy systems that don't work. They well, have, I, and then, so they have an incentive to not, to not, you know, use bad methods. Well, I think your audience is quite receptive to that message, given yeah. what the yeah, demographic so is. I'm not, I'm not used to giving compliments, and I'm not known for that, so. Well, we have a lot of questions waving okay. right now. We've so, got one over there, and then one over there, and then I'm over there. So you, you asked us to identify ourselves. I'm a person who spent time with no skin in the game. Um, Charles Millard, I ran the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation and oversaw a lot of failure uh, without any skin in the game on my own part. And I think what you've said is very, very true, how many bureaucrats make decisions and move mountains without actually any risk to themselves. So that's a very insightful point. I wanted to ask you, on the public pension front, you mentioned that states face many problems. Who do you think has skin in the game? I, I would assert, of course, the pension recipients do. Yes. But who has skin in the game? Who can actually affect the outcome, and what I, would you do to try to solve that problem? I'm not very knowledgeable about the structure of, of, of the pension, so I don't want to make a mistake. It usually takes me 20 years before, <laughs> before uh, you know, making, uh, uh, forming an opinion. So I mean, I'm slow. I mean, uh, the Black Swan took like I don't know, Fool by Randoms took uh, 15 years of writing, so it takes me a while to form an opinion. So I can't. Uh, I didn't think about it before, so I can't answer now on, on the spot. But no, we'll, I would see the, say, we'll see the book in 20 years' time. No, no, but I, would say, but I would say <laughs> that, that if, if you're correct, you should know, all right? If you're correct, okay, then we're, the, the business is in trouble if none of the recipients is managing it, you see? You have a good business, like, uh, you know, and, and a good business is when the, the person managing it is a prime customer. That's why hedge fund works, because you're the number one customer. Right. So, Question so, over here. Sure. So my name is Jack Melnikoff. I'm actually a founder of, of a hedge fund. So back to your previous point about a hedge fund. You know, I understand skin in the game, but how about the, the flip side where you say a manager has 25 to 75% of his net worth in the fund? How about if, if that manager is not acting accordingly because he's preserving capital, he's not taking the risk that someone wants him to take? in that hedge fund. May not blow up to your point, yes. but not if it's someone's designating a certain amount of capital for, for perfect, a certain risk perfect profile. Question. Is there such a thing as too much skin in the game, okay, where you're no longer aligned with your uh, clients, okay, uh, utility function because you have too much skin in the game, okay? It's sort of like 
uh, uh, in medicine, you have a lot of cases like that when people treat their own patients and stuff. They're, they're, they, it's not optimal policy anymore. The point is that you got to communicate to your clients, and your track record, recent track record, will reflect your risk aversion. You see, so the, the client, if you have too much skin in the game in your fund, someone very conservative will come to you. You see, if you're uh, risk averse, and if you're risk still risk loving, it would show in your uh, in, in your uh, positions and your trading strategy. Okay, if you have fifty percent of your money in your fund, you're gonna flip. You're not gonna flip overnight from hyper aggressive to hyper conservative. Your style will be will will would be you know. Uh, would change, you know, with, with your mood, but not too much. That's the point. But you're obligated to communicate to your clients that you know what, I have a different utility of the profits I'm going to take them. Okay, maybe for you it's small, for me it's big. You have, you're obligated to tell them if you, so long as you're transparent. You're okay. Question over there. Uh, Doctor Taleb, thank okay. thank you so much, Harry Sudak from Grid Infrastructure. Um, my question for you is, uh, what institutions out there are you betting against, and what instruments are you using to bet against them? <laughs> okay. I think a short time, but tell us your trading portfolio now. OK. Uh, I'm betting for, OK, the first thing is you've got to understand I'm in a business of tailor risk hedging. All right? So when you're in a business of tailor risk hedging, uh, the, the first comment I would make is that people don't understand how important tailor risk is, because people think it's an expense. What I view it as it allows you to, without it, you, can, you, can, you shouldn't take risk. So if you have any, and, and it's mis, misunderstood with people doing cost benefit analysis. You cannot do cost benefit analysis on a roulette, okay, on Russian roulette, you see. So most people don't understand the dynamics. If you blow up, you, you know, the, all your benefits are gone. So you have to make sure to stay above water. That's a uh, necessity. So that's the first comment I would make. So there's the tail <laughs> risk visibly. Uh, hedging, but I would I would say the bets I'm making now, it's uh, I hate gold, but I have convex bets on gold. The uh, ever all these small instruments that give you convex bets on gold. Uh, why why do I hate gold? Uh, I don't understand it. But why do I have gold with bets on gold? I don't know. It's just like if I don't have gold, I feel bad. If I have gold, I feel bad, but not as bad. All right. <laughs> so 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 it's not like you have all these gold bugs. So this is I have gold and what all the GDX and stuff like that. What about cryptocurrencies? Like Would you feel? Uh, yeah, the thing is, I have I have Bit I wore Bitcoin socks, okay? Yeah. Because I haven't been able yet to uh, because of regulatory reasons to uh, uh, to invest in, uh, in in the right uh, platform. Okay. That that was that was. What? So you bought the socks instead? Yeah, so I have the stocks now, no, but I'm getting into it. But I, so, so I have the Bitcoin stocks, but I don't have Bitcoin investments. Okay, I'm transparent, and uh, it's sort of like also like I bought euros. I hate you. I, ha I hate the euro. Uh, do I own it? Yeah, I feel obligated. Okay, I don't know why. So, so there's a lot of things. When you when you have skin in the game, you don't have to explain things. Okay, you just tell them what you're doing and say it was a big impression. But look, I have skin in the game. So, uh, like, like gold, I, I could never rationalize why I own gold, but I, I cannot not own it. <laughs> There's something about the environment, its price action, stuff like that. And of course, you got to be. I also have short uh, things that that blow, you know, make money if there's a rise in interest rates. And okay, is it from rational reason? Yes, interest rates at, at low levels can rise, but cannot, you know, go very negative because then it becomes very arbitrageable. Uh, Another one, maybe there's this, maybe there's something else, but at least I have, uh, there's this, I feel comfortable having a hedge against interest rates. And then also I start to see inflation. Uh, you know, you, they don't have to measure, maybe the, they don't have to measure inflation because you get, uh, I don't know if the size of, you've, you've had a steak recently in a restaurant, okay? Unless you go to places that just sell steaks and declare it's a 16 ounce. The, the, the size of the steaks has been, you know, the portions, the burrata portions are shrinking. So you have inflation that's not measured by the things. And every time I get a smaller steak, I buy gold on spot, right? So, so that is, <laughs> that's what I've been doing. Right. The question over here. Thank you. Uh, Rick Ross, I work with Family Office and also I'm the Connecticut Pension Fund Oversight Committee. Um, sounds like a great book. Um, if I'm correct, you're talking about asymmetry and optionality in daily life. Yes. Can you give some examples? I mean, I've been looking for this. So, uh, can you give where in skin in the game or in 
In that book, yeah. No, scale and gain is mostly about reducing negative optionalities. Like, for example, your CEO of a company, they say, well, you know, uh, but look, you transfer your risk to the pension fund, to the uh, share, to, to, uh, you transfer it to shareholder and eventually to taxpayer, for example. Or if you, uh, or the, the big, uh, the big, uh, the bet noir in here, to me, the, the really person I focused on is the uh, uh, think tank person or bureaucrat in Washington uh, causing wars, okay, and, and of course not being accountable for it, whereas in the past, uh, Roman emperors, of course, uh, were at the front of battle. And it's not just Roman emperors, Hannibal, Napoleon, they were, they were, they were in, the, in the battle. Napoleon maybe less, but, but you take uh, Hannibal, uh, uh, traditionally the, the, the person wages all the Byzantine emperors, Heracles, first in battle. I mean, for them, it's, they have to be more exposed than others, otherwise they're not. So, and now we have the reverse. So it's first generation in history. George Bush, the father, remember, was, was a prisoner of war. Okay, George Bush, the father. So something happened in that genera within a generation, okay, to uh, remove that skin in the game with wars now being led like computer games. So this is what I worry about morally and of, of course uh, risk-wise. So, so this is uh, my bet noir, the, 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 my, the person I hate the most is, uh, let's say someone like, uh, what's his name? I mentioned his, every time I mention his name, I get, I get, I get angry, and then, but it's good for weightlifting because uh, uh, the, my, my, you know, when you want to lift, deadlifting, you know, you, you get angry, you deadlift better. Um, the Thomas Friedman. For, for me, he is to me a horror of society. You see, he causes wars, <laughs> and then he's in the air conditioning office. Right? So every every time I mention his name, I get angry. Or every time I see, I've seen him. So that, for example. So the person any, causing war. Yeah, go ahead. So there any more questions? Well, because the other question I had, um, we've only got a few more minutes. But if anyone's got any more questions, no. What next? You've laid out this five-part series okay. on how to rethink risk. Um, I should say, in addition to the five-part bestsellers and the books, there's also a series of academic papers um, and some quite beautifully illustrated essays that you've done with your own illustrations that you can find online for them for free. But yeah. um, what next? Do you think you now understand risk? No. I, I, basically, the whole idea of the inserto, I understand one thing. Which is that it took me uh, 25 years to get that point. See, I'm slow. I'm slow. Is I understood the inserto. Uh, who's traveling here today? Flying. Okay, uh, are flying. If someone tells you there's uncertainty about the the, the the skills of the pilot, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, very good. All right. So, <laughs> the more uncertainty there is in a system, the easier the decision. Okay. It's just if if Warren Buffett is uncertain about a company, what does he do? There's a part, the, the, the annual report, thanks, by next one, no? So it took me a long time to figure out that you don't have to take risk. So that solves a lot of problems. The climate, there's a lot of uncertainty in the models, and I think they're horrible. So I wrote a paper, and I was attacked by both sides, which is great, all right? <laughs> that the more uncertainty we have about the climate, okay, the less we should pollute simply because we don't know what the effect is, because these models are wrong, okay? which is the opposite. So that's the message of the inserto. If you don't know what's going on, it's much easier to make a decision okay, than if you know what's going on. So uncertainty, in a way, how to handle it, it's a positive. Right. So that's the message. Now, the next step from this is um, I have uh, some technical stuff that may affect, some people may not like it here. But, it's quite uh, a technical crowd. No, no, but. yeah, technically they won't like it. Uh, showing exactly uh, why the hero finance is nonsense. Okay, why nudge is nonsense, uh, and why uh, pretty much risk parity methods are nonsense. And then the people who really got it right from the beginning are people who made sure you you know to optimize in a certain way, like the Kelly criterion, uh, all that group of people. They had the right, they had it right, and everything was done in economics because you know no skin in the game. It's, you know they need to publish papers, judged by people who publish papers. So it's. Uh, what, what you guys in the UK call a uh, self-licking lollipop, mm -hmm. all right? So that's so that that academia, Markowitz, all these models, modern finance, they don't work, okay? But there's others that work, and and I'm doing something technical, uh, not technical. Right. I'm doing a you know a, 
inflammatory piece uh, on that. So the, and, uh, the anti-risk parity. No, risk parity makes absolutely no sense mathematically, right? So why do people use it? Well, you know, if you do this, if you, so it, it, what is fraud should be, you know, it's fraud. I mean, you're not going to change it. Markowitz is nonsense because you say outside the Gaussian world, it doesn't work. And, but there are a lot of things that are very robust, okay? Like, uh, like all the gambling literature, all the stuff on information theory, all the stuff from Kelly Criterion, all, they work. <laughs> They're a lot better. So uh, the whole idea comes from the fact that you can, you have to optimize on as if you're going to redo the same thing tomorrow, the day after, the day after, the day after. And that's how they approach things. Right. And then therefore you leave no room to blow out <laughs> because you blow out once, you can't continue. So, and that's the last chapter. It's called the logic of risk taking. But it takes me, I mean, I, I traded for, I mean, about something like 30 some years, 37 years after starting to trade, I finally understood stuff that wasn't my guts. So it makes a, it takes a while for things to go from your guts to your brain. Right? <laughs> so well, so and it. then they, 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 they finally I explained it, the never cross a river if it's um, on average 40 feet deep and stuff like that. So it's very right. elementary stuff. But let me tell you, I'm gonna ask you a question. You're an archeologist. Okay, well, yeah. there are a lot of stuff that, the difference between archeologists and those psychologists is as follows. The psychologist pathologizes you for doing something wrong. Archaeologists know, they try to find a survival reason for it. So if someone has weird beliefs that uh, you never sleep on the coast, you should go up because your ancestors, uh, you know, uh, ghosts may come haunt you, all right? For example, mm -hmm. a psychologist would say it's irrational, all right? It's an irrational belief, whereas an anthropologist would say, well, maybe that's a way they survive by having these weird beliefs because it's easier to market, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then therefore they survive tsunamis because they never sleep on low ground, for example. Yeah. Okay, so I think that, that you, you can detect, if, if you in the world from that standpoint, instead of pathologizing weird things, you, 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 you can detect that what's happening with, uh, with the beliefs of people in, yeah. in the street. Okay, that, that people are sort of fed up with a system that makes no sense to them, that IYI, that has psychologists yeah. in it, and economists, and macroeconomists, and all of that, okay? So, don't, don't you, do you agree with me on, on? I would strongly agree that anyone who says a populism has just, you know, exploded by chance or as a futile gesture or because of irrationality is wrong, yes. So, populism, um, as Ray said yesterday, reflects something quite, under, quite fundamental in the current system. Political volatility does too. And that's going to be a very interesting question. But um, we are very sadly out ah, of time. Okay. Ah. Um, you've given us an amazing set of oh, ideas great. for 25 years. <laughs> All I'd say is here's to the next 25. And I have no doubt that your next 25 years worth of ideas that are currently moving from your gut to your head are going to be just <laughs> as influential. So ah, thank, great, you. Great. thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work, meaningful relationships. Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni trench debt to middle market companies. Ropes and Gray, bright past, brilliant future. Aurora Capital, inspiring partnerships. And Gramercy Funds Management. We are emerging markets. Special considerations to Bank of America. Life's better when we are connected. NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Gotai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.